Um, so Constitution Week is next week. We'll highlight that. Deaf Awareness Month, Hispanic Heritage Month, and celebrate the Southwest Middle School groundbreaking. And then we'll go into committee reports and approval of the consent agenda, the asterisk items that you see, utility committee minutes, city commission minutes, and then we'll go to Palmer. Do you want to do those now or in order, Palmer? Yes, I'd like to you can uh, address the consent agenda now if you'd like. Yeah. That's what the mayor usually does. Uh, the first item is a water item. It is a task authorization with CHA Consulting for Engineering Services related to the recoding of the filter bases of the TB Wood water plant. Uh, they're going to uh, design that uh, that work and handle the construction inspection and that type of thing. Total up to see cost uh, with the associated with the task authorization is $129,875. That is included in water utilities FY22 budget. It's going to require approximately 12 months to complete. Uh, Robbie is here to explain the technical side of what we're doing. Yeah. So essentially, the filters are like three big swimming pools. Ultimately, a contractor will get in and blast all the existing coating off, put the new coating on. This is a task authorization for the engineering, so they'll be the ones that put the project manual and the spec together that will go out to bid. Um, probably two or three years ago, we used this company to redo the filters at the Cumbie plant, and that went really well. And I figured they really can reuse most of their documents, so, <laughs> so they have the experience of that. It should be a little bit of a cost saving, so that's how we arrived at using CHA again. They're on our continuing services contract. So they'll do the project manual about, I think, $60,000 was for the engineering, and the other $70,000 is for construction services. They'll help us with inspection while construction is, is taking place. With coding projects, you want to make sure that the surface prep is perfect, otherwise it won't stick and you just have a big failure. So we, we have them out there to monitor, mostly environmental conditions. You don't want too much humidity, temperature, all these things have to be just right. We end up tarping these things and putting dehumidifiers in there to control the environment in that area. So we'll blast all that out, pull the existing media out, um, recode it, put new media in, put it back in service. There's three of them, do one at a time. Do you have any questions for Robbie? Mr. Kinnis? All right. Thanks. All right, the uh, second consent item, uh, also water item, is uh, for the purchase of uh, two dry polymer processing systems for the Glendale, Glendale Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, this is a, a part of the treatment process for the separation of solids. We have some very old uh, polymer systems at Glendale dating back to 1986 that are obsolete, and so they are in need of replacement. Uh, the purchasing department issued an invitation to bid on this matter and did not receive any responses, which has been a recurring theme lately. And so purchasing then uh, sought uh, direct quotes from three different firms. Uh, the low bidder from that process was Clearwater Industries out of Lake Mills, Florida at a cost of $154,681. Uh, city staff evaluated that bid and determined that it uh, was both the lowest and the most responsive uh, bid that we received or, or quote that we received. Uh, but these systems are scheduled to be installed and operational by December 30th of 2022 and are included within the FY22 budget. Uh, one of the technical side of it. Yeah, so just two big skids out there, it's tanks and, and piping. I say big, it's probably half as big as the table in front of you. They put the polymer in there, it mixes it up and it doses it in with the control system. It makes the solids combine together um, and then dewater. And ultimately, that's the product that we call fertilizer. We have a fertilizer license and it gets put onto pastures. Um, we actually got quotes, talked to purchasing, and they said, no, you're supposed to write a spec. So we did that. Nobody responded, so we went back and refreshed our quotes and ended up with these systems. We're going to self-construct it, if you will, so the companies will make the skids, deliver them, we'll get them unloaded, and then we'll install, do all the electrical, all the plumbing, do all that stuff ourselves. Yes, sir. Mr. Reed. Uh, who do we sell our fertilizer to? Um, I don't know the name of the two people out there. I know it's out in Polk City. Um, and we kind of have gentlemen's agreements with them, and, and I, I don't know their names. Do you know what we made, like 666? I think it's... We do it. We're working towards putting together a spec, and I don't know that it's necessarily we make anything. I think we're paying. At one point, we just gave it to them, and then one of them said, I don't even want it anymore because it was a material handling problem, and so we had to start paying him a little bit of money to hire equipment to spread it around. We're working towards putting a, 
uh, more or less have bid together that will run through purchasing that will tell people to bid on it. We hope that it will be a way for us to make money on it. There's a chance they'll say, yeah, I'll take it, but you still have to pay me for it. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. And we're going to try and open that up and find some other people. Um, I'd say it's just it becomes a material handling problem because it's it's not super dry, so it's kind of wet. So when you put it in a spreader, um, you have a hard time getting it to flow through the spreader, and yeah, so it's really it's just bulldozing and and, and spreading the best you can. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, Homer. Um, so then that takes us back to number one, request to appear from the general public from Dr. Negron of the Mayor's Hispanic Advisory Council. We'll have legalization hearings, and then we will go into second reading. So, Homer, that's good. All right, so second readings, the first three items are all related to the uh, new Southwest uh, Lakeland uh, uh, Park. Uh, it's the uh, amendment to the comp plan, zoning, and a conditional use uh, in order to uh, Get the proper authorization for that uh, park out there. Chuck's pulling up uh, some visuals for you. And really, the only change since we last presented this back in August is that the Department of Economic Opportunity has reviewed the uh, transmittal of the land use request, had no comments, and so now we're ready to move forward with adoption. I'm just kind of scrolling through what we presented previously. We're excited to, excited to get this adopted and uh, move towards getting a park in Southwest Lakeland. <laughs> Questions on this first one? Okay. All right, so that was one, two, and three. That takes us all the way to four, which is a uh, modification of PD uh, approval to increase the maximum building floor area for a self storage facility off of uh, State Route 33 to the north. Uh, 72,000 square feet to 99,536 square feet. Uh, that, those are the maximums. Uh, what's actually out there right now is a 50,500 square foot facility that they are proposing to expand by 49,036 square feet and, and add a two story building. I'm sure. Sure. showing you where that is. And this is. This is just north of Lake Luther Road. Um, there has been one change to the um, to the layout plan and to the conditions, and this reflects actually what was approved by the Planning and Zoning Board. Previously, we had uh, discussed a 25 foot 9 inch height limit on the new building. It's actually 26 feet, so it's a difference of three feet or three inches, three inches. Uh, but that was what was adopted by the Planning and Zoning Board, just to keep it simpler uh, than having uh, 25 feet 9 inches. So uh, that change is included in the conditions. And we have also since received an, an email in opposition concerned about the site looking like an eyesore and making sure that, um, you know, essentially uh, we don't increase the, you know, increase the size of, of, of the, the facility there as a gateway into the neighborhood. Questions? Yes. Chuck, is that the same ownership? Yes. Okay, so it hasn't been purchased and rehabbed. This is part of their, their okay. This, this is all part of the same, same folks that have come through. Yep. Chuck, also, how did we how did we respond to the email complaint? What was the? I think uh, it's just really something that we put into the into the public hearing record, and just want to make sure that we acknowledge it, but also that we understand that the that the conditions as they are written are intended to address any of the non compliance issues that we have out there today and uh, of, of the existing facade facing. Really standard. improve it, honestly. Exactly. I mean, we look at that. Yeah. Exactly, and to make sure that the addition, you know, the addition of the building, while it is an, an additional enclosed uh, storage space, that the new building uh, meets all of our architectural requirements, and and so we. we we, we certainly understand understand the concern, but the intent here is is to um, keep everything within the existing envelope. Uh, we've limited the, the the height of the building to two stories, where the original request was three. Um, well, we do have some three story apartments down that road, correct? So that exactly. the height would not be out of place. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, we acknowledge acknowledge the concern, and we believe we've addressed it in the conditions and working with the applicant. 
Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Ortman. Just curious if the um, modifications, you know, the exterior, is it exterior facade improvements or would it be like landscape buffer improvements? Um, it, it's primarily uh, facade improvements, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some areas on the north side that we that we noticed during the investigation of the site that you know there needs to be some additional plantings. They either died off or there's there's some gaps in that in that ground level coverage that we discussed. Yeah, that, that needs to be filled in as well. Um, so it's it's primarily the facade, but we also want to make sure that the landscaping is is, is you know is, is brought up uh, to compliance as well. Okay. I have a quick question on PMZ, like. Way back, we were having some votes and things that there were majority, but it wasn't. There were some people not there all the time at planning and zoning. How are we on numbers and like I, quorum we, and all that good stuff? For we're, we're doing better lately. Um, I think a lot of what we saw back earlier in the uh, in the year was related to uh, you know folks being out for you know, out being sick, and there were you know other other things that were going on at that time. And so things have stabilized quite a bit. And so I think for the most part, we've at least got a you know we've been having at least five, but uh, okay. mostly seven okay. Uh, okay. In, in attendance. And so I, we've been doing much better. Awesome. Thank you. That, that was a problem earlier in the year. Yeah. Other questions on this? Okay. Thank so, you, Chuck. The next item is an amendment to a modification of a conditional use approval for Lakeland Regional Health out at the northwest corner of the interstate and Kathleen Road to allow a freestanding emergency room and some related type uses such as group homes, nursing homes, check. And exactly, and, and, and so this is just an expansion of what's already under construction. Uh, as we discussed previously, about 76, 77,000 square feet. Uh, freestanding uh, um, as, uh, uh, urgent care medical offices under construction now. The conditional use modification would allow for a freestanding emergency room uh, and an increase up to 300,000 square feet of, of medical office, uh, the freestanding emergency room, and other associated uses like uh, nursing homes or assisted living. Um, what I did do is include some recent pictures from last weekend uh, up the site just to show kind of what's going on today. Um, so there is visible construction from the Kathleen I-4 interchange. Um, and so the intent of the, the plan, I will scoot back to that real quick, is to essentially build on what's already con uh, construction, um, primarily focused along the Kathleen Road frontage as well as a couple of future development areas next to the 7-Eleven um, and then um, adjacent to the CSX rail line. Yes, sir. Thank you. You know, we're, we're seeing an awful lot of these type things popping up here. They know on Lakeland Hill and Boulevard, Lakeland and Highland Drive and here, and I think there's more planned down on the south side of town. Are we making adequate uh, inroads on how we want to maybe have a zoning classification? Are we, are we set up something in advance so we can have a better, con tighter, tighter control on some of these issues? Um, it's something we haven't really looked at in terms of, uh, of a land use category or a specific zoning category. Part of the issue that we have with, with especially large campuses like, like this one in Orlando Health is that they all have their own different mix of, mix of individual uses that fall, fall within the, kind of the medical, medical office or, or institutional type categories. And so you know, at this point, either through the conditional use process like here or the planned unit development process like Orlando Health, that's where you know, I believe that we're still getting to the level of detail that the public and, 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 and I think you all are looking for as well, because we can write specific conditions in terms of building layout, you know, operational uh, restrictions or, or, or uh, conditions, uh, buffering, those types of things, because the building heights are going to vary, the sites are going to be varied most of the time. Um, I think really the issues also boil down to you know, noise and transportation, uh, you know, how much traffic is being generated by these uses. And so a lot of times those aren't really anything that we've already got those issues covered in the Land Development Code. But we you know, really negotiate a set of development agreements where we you know, try to tailor the conditions to the specific hospital or institutional type use. So at this point, we haven't talked about a new category, um, but just kind of recognizing that these uses are unique, they're rather large, and, and that you know, a through, and this is really what the plan unit development process is designed for with development agreements or other types of agreements to, to address transportation or other off-site impacts. Because I was wondering, again, we see these, and if you go to these facilities, there's always parking issues. And again, we may want to up our parking requirements uh, in these type of facilities. So, again, you know, I keep talking about the same thing for apartment complexes as well. 
and, and, and that's exactly um, the, the conversation we had with Lincoln Regional as well as Orlando Health. We do have provisions in the code that allow for us to go above our 10% maximum. Um, you know, because right now the code generally allows, you know, we've got our minimum parking requirements and the maximum is 10% above that. But for specific uses like hospitals or uh, we find this with our kind of warehouse flex type buildings is that they provide us with a market analysis that shows that their parking demand for other similar facilities or X, we will approve that with uh, either additional landscaping, bioswells, pervious pavement, uh, we're getting into electric vehicle charging stations, other things to offset the footprint of that additional parking and the code already allows us to do that. Um, and so we definitely recognize that this use and, and we had the same conversation with Orlando Health earlier this week is that they have additional parking needs that we recognize and we're and, and we're working with them on that on that mitigation package there. Let's get in plus. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mr. Ruiz. Yes, so Commissioner, that what Chuck just described really, and we love our, our codes and standards and being able to point to a specific requirement, but the, the benefit of the PUD, or in this case, conditional use process, is it provides the staff, the commission, and the developer with the flexibility to really address those conditions at the specific site. Because no two are alike, as you well know. Thank you. Well, and there sometimes is a not so much parking problem as a walking problem. So, you know, that's, you're not going to pull straight up. Chuck's about to get to the, the meat of this one. <laughs> hey, can I ask really quick? Um, sure. On land use, are, do our land use codes, do they line up with the county's land use codes? So when they say institution, do, are we all speaking the same language? I think for the most part we are. Okay. Um, you know, there's some different variations in terms of when you start getting into the, the you know, the plan unit development process right. and the terminology that the county uses, but for the most part, we align fairly closely. And like we, we had talked about before, I mean, transportation is going to be a major issue with this, um, but we're going to address that uh, through the conditions here in, in, in a phasing plan that recognizes that, you know, we've got 77,000 square feet of medical office, you know, which is under construction now. We've got an existing convenience store on the site. Uh, where the way we've set it up at this point is, is we've already had analyses that showed that the, the, uh, the concurrency works at from a transition standpoint at 150,000 square feet, so we're not really focused in on that threshold other than wanting an analysis prior to the 150, and then beyond that, and what, what I'm calling phase two, is that we would have an updated operational safety analysis of the Kathleen Mothill intersection, where the hospital's traffic consultant did show that we are looking at some level of service failures at that particular location, but we've also had a significant rise in crashes, you know, including a pedestrian fatality at that location that warrants us to, to step back and not do a traditional, you know, let's just add more lanes to the approach to the intersection. And so what we want to do is give us a little bit of breathing room to be able to come up with something that gives us the capacity but addresses the safety issues as well. And then recognizing the Kathleen Road is a county facility and so Polk County is going to have to approve whatever mitigation package that we agree to with the hospital. Yes, Commissioner Madden. Thank you. Um, Chuck, in this uh, particular project and kind of looking at it going forward, are they approaching it similarly to Orlando Health, how they wanted to have a drive-through, a Starbucks, you know, kind of a Panera sort of site in, on site? Haven't really talked about commercial uses other than the convenience store. Um, that may that may change, but they certainly have not talked about anything related to a drive-through or, or or a highway-oriented type type use. It's really within that that medical office, medical institutional type um, type category. It just seems like every chance you have to just talk about that trend in, in development. You know, keeping people on site rather than in their car every time they you know, get out on the. And, and that's one of the things that at least in terms of looking at the larger area that would, especially with the amount of multifamily that we have, you know, we're starting to see Kathleen, Kathleen and Griffin becoming more of an important commercial node. Um, there is, you know, there, there is land already on the east side of Kathleen Road that does allow for a, um, uh, for commercial uses that are tied to the old, um, let's go back over here. 
so at the at the top there where you've got Cambridge Cove Apartments, just to the left of that, that vacant area is already allowed for commercial uses through the what we call the Mall Hill Center uh, PUD that now uh, Lake <coughs> Toyota, Chrysler, that's all part of that same master plan development. And so you could have commercial use there that would help provide um, um, some, some retail uh, amenities for the nearby residential on that side of the street. And then up at Griffin and Kathleen, we've got a move there. So in this area, we're trying to at least take pressure off, you know, make it so that folks don't have to go all the way over to 98 to go shopping or to catch the bus right. and try to build up the infrastructure on the side of, of the neighborhood. Commissioner Reed. Is the, is the Maddox property in the city? Maddox property is in the county. Um, and so that's 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 an area where if there is an opportunity in the future, and our comprehensive plan uh, was the project, but we, we, we see a need to extend Mall Hill across the railroad tracks over towards the Maddox property and eventually connect to, to Bella Vista, which would take pressure off of Fairbanks and Wabash, take pressure off of Knight Station Road. Um, it would be a good two-lane collector road, and the hospital's been working with us to you know, provide for that future extension. We would need to get across the railroad line, and, and, and certainly we would need cooperation from the Maddox property representatives as well as the county at some point in the future to make that happen. Do we want to talk to the two sisters about getting that piece in? I, I mean, I think it's something that's that's, that's worth the conversation for sure. Um, you know, but I think it's up to, you know, uh, we would need to take a look at it and see what it, what the impacts would be for utilities, you know, public services. I mean, kind of go through the normal annexation analysis. But I think that's something from a line, just strictly from a planning perspective. It's already in the planning areas adjacent to the city limit boundaries. It's worth a conversation, at least from a, you know an analysis standpoint, to see is it is it in the city's interest to, to pursue it any further. And of course, you all would have the final final say. Ten acre piece that we could plan now, as opposed to hand to pod budget. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. Good. <laughs> All right, the uh, next ordinance is, a, uh, uh, is an amendment to the city's uh, investment policy for the public improvement down, down fund. These are basically minor tweaks. Uh, the first tweak simply uh, changes one of the benchmarks that we are using for fixed uh, income investments. And then the second modification allows for the, uh, the, the, the uh, endowment fund board to uh, do a dentist with investment managers for the different investment vehicles in the portfolio without having to come back to the city commission. Uh, Jeff Stearns is here and can answer additional questions if you have them. Any questions? Or do you want to? No, I think, uh, I think he explained it fairly well. It's just a, a one change of one index because we moved our fixed income investments from longer to shorter. So you want to, if you're looking at performance, you want to compare it against an index that relates to shorter bonds and not longer bonds. And then the other point was that whenever we hire an investment manager, we hire them from for a very specific assignment. You'll hire them to do, you know, large cap equities or bonds or real estate. So you sign an addendum with each manager that tells them, A, what index we're going to compare them to, but also the parameters under which they can invest. Obviously, if they're doing large cap stocks, they're only supposed to do large cap stocks, and you define what that is, and then you define uh, other things like what percentage they can have in foreign stocks and how much cash they can keep and things like that. It kind of would be difficult every time we did that with a new manager or replaced a manager to come back to the city commission to amend the investment policy for that specific manager. The pension fund does this all the time, and the pension fund is allowed to do those things on their own. So this is just this kind of the same, similar procedure. Commissioner Reed, are the the short bonds are cheaper than the long bonds now? Well, everything is very very flat uh, in uh, on the yield curve. So literally, you can buy a you can get over three percent in the treasury in a ninety day T bill these days, and if you go out to thirty years you get 345 so it's incredibly flat and in the two year the two year bond is yielding more than the 30 year bond right now so we're in kind of a, an inverted yield curve but generally very very flat well, I know that's abnormal bonds it's not normal it's supposed to be an up, upward sloping yield curve most of the time where the longer you lock up your money the more you're supposed to get for doing that that is not where we are right now other questions Thank you, Mr. Stearns. All right, the uh, final ordinance uh, for consideration is uh, an ordinance 
uh, ratifying the actions of the Lincoln Air Mass Transit District and annexing two properties on uh, either side of the city that Chuck is showing you. And, and so the first one is within Parkway Corporate Center um, on the east side of South Pipkin Road. Um, the other is up on State Road 33, uh, just north of Exit 38. Um, and so these are these are being required as part of different development actions that are underway right now. They've been approved by the Lake and Area Mass Transit District Board, and so they're coming to the City Commission for final ratification. Just a quick question. Yes. Why? So the the one on Pipkin there. So that little square is just not part of the the Kinko property. Is not part of. Exactly. How, how is that? I mean, how did it get that like that? Um, over, over over the years, and, and, and this is something we've been trying to kind of address on a case-by-case -case basis, but the, the, the city limits um, just expanded beyond the Lake Area Mass Transit District boundaries. Uh, at one point in time, almost all of the city was within the transit district boundaries, but since the city has grown, the transit district really hasn't in this area. And so what we're doing is just trying to, you know, if they, if they need utility service or if there's a transportation concurrency need, which in this area is, you know, is, is, is the case, that, that, that we require annex, that they at least submit an annexation petition to LAMTED, and then LAMTED board decides if it's in their interest to bring it into the district and, and have no tax. Just to make connectivity as we go down yeah. the road. Other questions? All right, th those are all ordinances for second reading and action on Monday. Uh, we also have a resolution for adoption on Monday. That uh, We have uh, a uh, 2017 variable rate energy system bond series that is coming up for maturity on October 1st that we need to refinance. So this resolution is authorizing the issuance of new variable rate energy system bonds in the principal amount of $88,205,000 to, to, to again refinance the, the bond series that's coming up for maturity on October 1st. Jeff, do you want to add anything to that or is that... Uh, no, I mean, that's that's certainly the gist of it. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a finance committee meeting scheduled until Monday morning, but basically we have some variable rate notes that are part of LE's capital structure. They were five-year notes. They're coming up for maturity. They need to be replaced. Even though they're variable rate, they're not, this Lake Electric does not have variable rate exposure because there are swap agreements that go with them that are pre-existing, which basically lock in the rate so that it's a fixed rate as well, but the notes underneath have to be renewed every five years or so. They'll ultimately be paid off starting in 2030, and the final payment will be in 2038, but we need to roll them over for five years. We did an RFP and solicited a number of banks to do this. The winning bank with, with the lowest rate was <coughs> Truist Bank, which is the old SunTrust and BBT yeah. merger. And so that's what the documents that will be on the agenda for Monday are authorizing the issuance of the notes to replace the old notes. So even when we start paying it off in 2030, we're still in that five-year cycle. So we do five years right now, so then right. we get a 20. So we will have to renew yeah. these again. Then then we, again. We looked at renewing, we, renewing these notes for a longer term, but the rates became much higher and prohibitive. So we stuck with a five-year rollover. Okay. Other questions? As part of the process, we've done this before. I've got to pass out a, a, a sheet for you guys to sign to, to certify that you don't have a conflict of interest and there's no sunshine law violations. So I mean, you're going to have to attest that you don't have a conflict of interest with respect to Truist Bank. So unless you, know, you have some kind of employment or contractual relationship with Truist Bank, you know, it's, it's not a problem. You just need to sign the sheet that I'll pass out. That's part of what we need to do to close on the sale of the boss at Truist. I'll sign that today because I'm going Monday. Oh, okay. Um, well, you're not going to be taking action. This oh, sign, so. don't to yeah. um, all right. No CRA report, so we'll go to the city manager. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I have two items for presentation this morning, and then I would like to make a brief introduction after um, the two items. Uh, the first item is pretty lengthy and, and detailed, so this morning I'm just going to provide a summary, and then uh, at the meeting, if there's more information needed or greater detail, we will have staff there, and staff is with us this morning and can provide any of the details requested from the commission. Um, the first item that I'm going to present is a recommendation uh, related to um, the renewal of various uh, insurance policies for the city of Lakeland. This is part of our annual renewal process uh, and would be for fiscal year 2023. Um, we are assisted in this process by our broker of record that you're all familiar with, Arthur J. Gallagher, Risk Management 
services, the insurance um, that are being presented or the policies that are being presented. I will now go through each one again with just a summary. The first one is for um, property and boiler machinery. The city's total insured values have increased by 1.25%. Um, the most cost-effective approach for the city is to have um, two separate programs, and by separating the municipal from the utility programs, we will experience a reduction on the municipal property coverage and that will offset the increase in the utility program. Florida Municipal Insurance Trust, also known as FMIT, provided the most competitive quote out of 25 other carriers in the market. Uh, the renewal premium is being presented as a not to exceed, while our broker, A.J. Gallagher, continues to negotiate with underwriters to improve pricing and drive the lowest possible premiums for this coverage. The second uh, uh, program is for excess workers' compensation. Uh, the city self-insures our workers' compensation program. Uh, FMIT has again offered a competitive program for excess coverage. So we have maximum limits on our self-insurance, and if we had claims that exceeded that, this is the excess coverage that would assist us with that. This represents a uh, <coughs> decrease in the premium by uh, almost $12,000, and the decrease is based upon an improvement in the city's experience modification factor from a 0.85 to a 0.79, combined with a decrease in payroll of 0.09%. Uh, the next insurance is Inland Marine Electronic Data Processing. Hartford Insurance Company remains the carrier for this coverage as they were the most competitive respondent. This is for coverage on leased or owned golf carts, mowers, electronic data processing equipment, uh, a wheel loader that we have and other equipment. Uh, it represents an increase of $5,273 for this next year's premium. The next coverage is for Inland Marine Contractors Equipment. Markle American Insurance Company was selected to provide the physical damage coverage for various pieces of equipment. This would be for equipment that the city operates, such as great awls, street sweepers, vacuum trucks, and other similar equipment. Uh, the premium this year represents an increase of $984. The next coverage is for crime surety bond for the city treasurer. FMIT, who I mentioned a moment ago, has offered a robust, robust coverage and a reduced premium that equals a 70% savings and represents the most competitive respondent for our insurance programs. Next is uh, excess liability. The uh, city is self-insured for also things like auto, general law enforcement, public officials, and employment practices liability. For this coverage, there would be a $13,000 increase, representing about a 3% increase for this. And the final coverage is cyber liability. Chubb Insurance Company is providing a renewal quote for the coverage, which is inclusive of, inclusive of network security and privacy liability, data breach fraud, and internet media liability. Chubb was able to offer a renewal quote this year, while other entities were unable to obtain this type of coverage. This one does have an increase of $34,119 for the premium for the year. So the recommendation will be for the city commission to consider approving the renewal of these different insurance programs with the different providers that I have mentioned. Again, staff is here if there are any questions. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, I see new banks and new equipment for the golf course. We're going to cover that next. All right. Well, I'm going to see if this is that insurance going to cover those versus the lease product versus the. It, it, yes, it would. Right. Yes, but what we're about to cover um, is not on the leased golf carts. So the, the purchase we're covering in the next item does not include our fleet of leased golf carts that are used at the golf course. Is that correct, Brock? You mean yes. insurance? Mm -hmm. The insurance doesn't cover the least? Well, no, I'm just talking about when we're talking about the, what's covered here, it would cover the golf carts. But when you ask the question about the golf carts we're about to, to purchase, um, those are, are not included. Well, they're, they're not listed in this item. So we're going to have to get additional insurance for those? No, it will be covered by this insurance, but we just didn't list. Where we list the different types of golf carts here, it was not, we didn't include in the item, but yes, it would be covered by yeah. that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. 
Okay. The next item um, is regarding the purchase of the uh, golf course equipment, uh, maintenance equipment that was just um, discussed. Um, and the maintenance equipment for the golf course uh, is requested to be purchased instead of renewing the current lease on these various different um, pieces of equipment. The types of equipment that we are referring to here would include a purchase of some mowers, some utility carts, different than the golf carts, and that's what I was trying to point out just a moment ago. These are utility type carts, um, uh, some spreaders, and a green roller, and a gang mower, and other similar types of golf course uh, maintenance of equipment. Um, it's recommended that these pieces of equipment be replaced due to the high hours on the equipment and the age of each of the pieces of equipment. Based on the cur current interest rate, purchasing the, uh, purchasing the equipment versus leasing will realize a savings of over $94,000 for the city. The purchase will be via state contract from Wesco Turf, Beard Equipment Company, and Global Turf. The purchase cost for the various different items is $430,259. Um, this would be purchased through the issuance of an internal loan. Debt service for that loan is included in the 2022 operating budget for the golf course. And so the recommendation will be to purchase this equipment to realize the savings as presented and to authorize a corresponding appropriation for that pur purchase. That completes presentation. We do have several different members from our golf course here. If there are any questions, any questions? Commissioner Reed. No. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Looks like you did. All right. Okay, and then just a, a brief um, um, uh, introduction I would like to make. We don't always introduce uh, managers when they are hired here at the city, but we have hired a new manager that the commission uh, and the public will be interacting with pretty frequently. So I want to introduce to our new um, CRA manager who is with us this morning, Miss Valerie Farrell. Miss Farrell is certainly no stranger to the city of Lakeland. Valerie worked for the city of Lakeland previously, worked in the the, the CRA department um, or division, I should say, uh, had an opportunity to, to go to some other uh, governments and to um, to grow her career and uh, and professionally develop and is now returning to the city of Lakeland. So we're happy when we get to tell those stories, people who went and, and got other experiences and, and now we benefit from that when they return. So I'm sure that Ms. Farrell is going to do a great job as our CRA manager and I want to welcome her this morning. Awesome. Welcome. Love that. Okay, um, finance director for legal fees. Is that you, Deidre? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good morning. It's an appropriation and increase in legal fees for the general fund. During fiscal year 2022, the city experienced an increase in the number of legal matters, particularly in the area of litigation filed against the city that the city attorney's office was required to defend. This litigation involved the defense of complex legal issues related to employment matters, federal claims arising out of code enforcement issues, and other civil rights claims, as well as union matters on behalf of Lakeland Electric and Fire. As a result, there was an increase in the cost being paid to outside legal counsel for their expertise in defense of these claims. The original legal department legal fee budget for fiscal year 22 was $241,196. However, as, as the end of the fiscal year approaches, the city attorney's office is required to true up its legal fee budget to what is anticipated as the final expenditure of approximately $525,494. Therefore, it is requested that the city commission authorize an appropriation in the general fund in the amount of $284,298 from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund for fiscal year 22, specifically related to the increased cost for outside legal counsel fees for the defense of the city and various legal matters. Any questions? Mr. Music. Yeah, um, I, I think it's great that we have the wisdom to, to look outside when we need to. So when we, when we true these things up and we pull from the general fund, um, Explain to me how, from a budget standpoint, that works. Um, at the end of the at the end of the year, if we if we have money that we didn't allocate, let's say this didn't come up, what happens to that 
chunk of money, it just would roll over Correct. to the next year? Yeah, any unspent funds would roll over into the unappropriated surplus of the general fund. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Good question. Yes, sir, Commissioner. Oh, you know, we, it seems like these keep going up every year. Don't we? Do, you, do we have an idea on percentage that goes up every year? Are we are we ready for a fourth attorney now or what? Well, uh, um, uh, there's a true up every year, and we are actually making an adjustment in the upcoming budget, and I think we talked to you about that in the one-on-ones to put this number at a more realistic number. But, you know, when a, when a lawsuit comes in, um, you know, we assess that for whether there's an opportunity to settle it, uh, and a lot of the lawsuits that are resulting in these legal fees, we have attempted to settle those cases for something that makes sense, and, and, and we're, you know, the... the other side is it sees their case in a completely different manner sure. than we do. We're way apart. In some cases, we've been millions of dollars apart in how we assess the cases. In that case, we have no option but to just vigorously defend you know, the city's position. So that's very expensive. Um, and when we have a when we have a uh, a judgment against, where does does that come from? Insurance policy or? Uh, and talking about the general fund, where does, where does that money go? It depends on what what the lawsuit was about. Uh, this is just a tort claim, you know, the fender bender, or, you know, some kind of auto accident. Uh, we have a self-insured retention fund you know, that we set aside to, to pay those types of things on a regular basis. I mean, there's always little fender benders going on and people tripping on cracks and sidewalks, things like that, and, and those are paid out of our self-insurance retention fund. Do we know how much, how much, about how much we have in that? Uh, which Joyce had, uh, had, had left, but uh, she would have that answer. Uh, we can find that out. Uh, I know we paid out, we agreed to pay out somebody on a, not long ago on a drain field. Yeah, the police. Yeah. 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 Right. And that was... Right, and sometimes the, the, the department that, you know, that the mm -hmm. issue arises out of is charged, and then they re refund the uh, uh, self-insured fund for those. Other questions? And just for the general public, like this is why tort reform would be handy, because tax dollars go into litigation in Florida as a litigious state, and so we have our open for a lot of things, and um, there are a lot of trial lawyers, and you know they seize opportunities. Uh, and there are times that there are mistakes, of course, and that we are absolutely accountable for. But I feel like our state's probably a little different. Wouldn't you agree? Legally, like as far as we're very cost, litigious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we are. We're um, very litigious. And there's two different issues involved. If it's just a state tort claim, there's sovereign immunity limits. Right. So we're only liable for up to two hundred thousand dollars to an individual. <clears throat> If multiple people were injured in the accident, we could potentially be liable for up to 300000 by state law. There's always the ability to file a claims bill, but those usually don't go anywhere with the legislature. Uh, with a federal civil rights claim or a contract claim, however, there is no limit. So, you know, we're, we're completely exposed on the up, upside on those. And that's why you saw under the city manager's uh, portion of the agenda that we're, you know, acquiring excess liability coverage deal with that, you know, open exposure on, you know, for other than a state tort law claim. Yes, Commissioner. And Zick. when, you know, when uh, Commissioner Reed asked, you know, if it was time to consider another lawyer, and I saw Ramona <laughs> laughing. <laughs> but mainly, you know, that, that, you know, staff like yours can be seriously overworked at times when things come through, but would it make sense, though, with the, <clears throat> with the number of claims we would co have come in on that, to have a lawyer that specifically worked on that, or it... it it does the way that municipalities work make sense to just sub that stuff out? Up to now, we think it makes sense to sub it out. Okay. I mean, because there's more than just a lawyer involved. There's usually a paralegal and assistant. Yeah. I mean, you're bringing in multiple team. personnel to, to handle these lawsuits. And, yeah. and so, but we don't have enough of that to, to justify that consideration at this point. We may at some point. I, yeah. I, right now, I don't think we do. Are there are there, are there cities that do? I mean, there, there are cities and counties that have teams of 30 and 40 lawyers wow. whole litigation departments, okay. usually the bigger places are like that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And two, it's specializing. It depends on the topic. We're not just, you know, these, these right. don't just cover, you know, yeah. tort law. Like it's, it could be, you know, all sorts of different things that come in. Yeah. And so it'd be usually, it's like a specialist, you know, and a doctor's Which office. is why it seems to make sense. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That you a, lot of these, a, lot, a lot of the more expensive claims are from like federal civil rights type right. of lawsuits that get very involved, very complicated. And you want the people that do that, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? 
All right, Ramona, I think you're up. Um, we, have the the of, <laughs> we have a number of utility items today. The first one is an agreement with Schneider Electric Systems USA. Uh, this is for the control system agreement for Larson Unit 8 and the Winston um, picking station. Uh, back in 2017, we had entered into an agreement with Schneider to uh, cover not only the Winston um, peaking station and Larson Unit 8, but um, Units 2 and 3, and obviously those have been removed from that, two, 2 and 3 have been removed from that support agreement. So now the existing support agreement is scheduled to terminate at the end of September, and we are entering into a new uh, agreement with Schneider for uh, support and services that will and essentially excuse me enable the city to receive a discount on replacement parts that are necessary for the controls um, and also have techs be able to Snyder's techs log in remotely to handle any issues that arise um, and and be able to diagnose and provide real-time analysis um, as well as provide uh, software maintenance and upgrades for for the control system. Uh, Snyder is the original equipment manufacturer of the control systems and so the purchasing department did approve this as a as a sole source uh, provider. The total cost of the three-year agreement, which would be effective October 1st, is $380,006. And that is included in Lakeland Electric's FY23 budget as well. Questions from Ramona? Okay. The second item we have is a change order with Chatt Chattanooga Boiler and Tank Company. This is the a change order to the existing agreement we have with Chattanooga for the purchase of two field fabricated lube oil tanks for the rice project. If you recall, back in July, we approved, uh, the commission approved an agreement with Chattanooga and that was for the um, the heat recovery tank for the rice project. Uh, when we initially, this, the two lube oil tanks that we're going to be getting, one is a 10,000 uh, uh, oil storage, 10,000 gallon oil storage tank. The other one is a 6,000 gallon oil maintenance tank. Uh, the 10,000 gallon oil lube tank will store the makeup oil for the engines while they're running. The 6,000 um, gallon lube oil maintenance tank will store the oil from the engine um, when it needs to be removed for maintenance purposes. Uh, originally, uh, staff went out for a bid to do um, to uh, have storage, or, um, sorry, shop fabricated tanks, and then when we got those bids back, we realized that those didn't meet the needs of what we were wanting for the project. So going back and looking at it, it was more cost effective to actually have Chattanooga provide the field fabricated tanks, which will actually be put together on site and constructed. Uh, that will be done in by February of 2023. The total cost for those two additional tanks is $472,482. We received that proposal, but I think we've talked about this a couple other times during other meetings and other items we had presented the last commission meeting, how we're dealing with market conditions and we're wanting to put a contingency in the, the price of about 5% of the total price, which equates to about $23,624 because when they submitted their, their price for the tanks, that could be adjusted based on what the supplies will cost. And that is included as well in the Rice Project budget that was previously approved by the City Commission. How are we doing on that budget with contingencies? I mean, I'm glad we built these here. I'm glad we built in that extra room, but... But we're using it at every... We're, it seems like every time we approve <laughs> something, we're using it. Like... Yeah, um, right now we're doing okay on the contingency. I mean, uh, uh, I'm right at about five and a half million dollars into the eighteen million dollar contingency. Okay. Uh, I am going to need approximately another three hundred thousand dollars just for MAN that we'll have to bring back to the commission. Um, so we're we're doing okay. okay. Um, uh, these tanks here initially were were. Uh, uh, they should have been a lot cheaper um, pre-COVID. They would have been a lot cheaper. Um, um, the the price was pretty much uh, uh, even, they're, they're more than the average increase above. Um, the the other quotes that Ramona talked about, we actually went up to bid twice. Both times they came back, the quotes came back incomplete. They were bidden 
you know, partial packages, half baked, not all the stuff they want. It's kind of like you ordered the car, but oh, you want the engine too? And right. You want the wheels too? You know, that, I mean, they just excluded so much stuff. It's like we had so much work. It's like these things are insane. Um, um, so we went out. So, um, uh, from that, the, the you know the tanks and other things we've experienced with other manufacturers, our process itself that it takes to just get purchasing through, what we're seeing is is that we're having to use up some of that contingency because we get the quotes, we go through the process, we go through the contract negotiations, but that price isn't valid anymore. We got to add a little bit more, so that's the contingency. I think we're doing okay. <coughs> with all that being said, I'm, I'm, we're doing okay with our contingency. I owe um, a document to uh, Gina. Um, um, hopefully, I'll get it to her on Monday. Um, that basically talks about that. But right now, I'm at about five and a half million okay. into my 18. My next big contract is coming up. It's one that Ramona and I are reviewing right now. It's for the above ground contract. Um, it was estimated to be at uh, 22 million, I think, is what the initial estimate was. And it's probably going to come in closer to 30. Okay. And so, I'm going to use some more of that contingency there. So, but uh, overall, I think we're still going to be okay. Um, and, and still bring the project in under the 145 that was approved. Thank you for sharing all that. And it's usually helpful. a lot of these contingency <clears throat> budgets you see are, are typical in construction right. type agreements, yeah. but not typically when you're ordering like equipment or right. things like that. But because of where we're at, supply chain and market, that's, that's why we're kind of trying to build this in yeah. to provide so we don't have to come back you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate your transparency on all that. That's very helpful to us as commissioners. Thank you. What is what is the $650,000? Is that a different tank? Yes. So uh, we got, we got a 200,000 gallon fuel tank, and then these are the oil tanks? Or uh, the 200,000 gallon tank is a water tank. Water tank? Yeah, it's a water tank. That'll be for the heat recovery system. We'll heat the water. Um, um, the water is heated because in order to maintain the diesels to where they're fast start, uh, diesels, I'm sorry, they're not diesels, the rice engines so they're fast start, you have to keep them warm. They, the the uh, lube oil has to be kept around 104 degrees and the engine blocks around 100, uh, uh, 140 degrees. And so you have to have this this supply. And so what we've done is, is one of the projects and the enhancements we did uh, to try to save the city of Lakeland uh, ratepayers money is we put in this your system as a cost savings because what it does is it actually seals the waste heat off the engines while they're operating and stores it so that way when they're not operating we can use that to keep them warm. That's what that first tank for. It's a 200,000 gallon tank. It's just a, um, a, a, a heat source. Um, for when the units are offline. That's what that takes for. Um, uh, we we looked at the possibility of using other on-site tanks that we have, but none will fit the need that we had. And so that tank will be out there, it'll be insulated, um, um, and uh, it'll receive that heat. These two tanks, what they're for is, is, as we talked about before, the rice engines, just the nature of the engine, the size of the engines, they use oil all the time. They can actually use up to two gallons of oil per hour. Uh, each engine and so what you do is you have a supply of oil that you bring in the engines will automatically refill themselves to make sure that they keep their lupo system stopped off um, and uh, it's a storage to make sure we have that oil supply there and then like Ramona said the maintenance tank what it's for is okay I gotta go in I gotta I got to uh, um, pull a piston or a connecting rod or something. Well, I got to empty the lube oil sump. Well, the lube oil sump has 5,000 gallons in it. So I have a 6,000 gallon tank to transfer that oil to during those maintenance periods. Mm. So I don't have to just dispose of it and buy new or get uh, temporary tankers and things like that. So that, that's the difference. The first one was the heat recovery. These are for the oil storage tanks. Mm. And the heat recovery is something the contract that we had brought yeah. previously to you yeah. had you approved as well. Thank so. you. All right. Does that help Commissioner Reed? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Okay, the last item that we have is an agreement with Trees LLC. This is for our annual line clearance services. An important part of what Lakeland Electric does is to try to maintain uh, our transmission and distribution lines by clearing away the vegetative growth. Um, we have approximately 1,200 uh, miles of distribution line miles, and the goal is to basically clear about 400 miles per year over a three-year period to get to that, to, to cover the total uh, amount of miles. We went out for a bid um, uh, because Burford's Tree LLC, who is our existing contractor, that contract um, expires. Um, and when we went out for bid, we received a number of proposals. Tree's LLC was... Um, selected as the most responsive responsible bidder, although not lowest in cost. 
However, when staff reviewed the bids, uh, there were, were some issues with the, the low bidder, Lewis Tree, with regard to labor rates that they included in their bid, which were really below market and, and could probably uh, be a, a problem with regard to uh, performance and being able to have the appropriate uh, staff to, or uh, personnel to, to clear the lines. Uh, there were also several other exceptions in the bid that would impact overall cost with regard to response time and restoration and new projects. So ultimately, uh, Trees LLC was selected um, as the ability the contractor uh, best able to meet the city's needs. It's, this is a three-year contract. It would be effective October 1st and has two additional one-year options of renewal. It does, uh, the, the total estimated cost of FY23 is $4,277,120. That's included in Lakeland Electric's FY23 <coughs> budget. And then the estimated cost for FY24 uh, and 25 is built into uh, the Trees LLC's uh, bid price, and it basically is a 3% uh, increase over uh, for F FY24, 3% increase over FY23, and likewise, FY25 would also be a 3% increase as well. Any questions for Rona? Commissioner Music? So the current uh, <coughs> contract that we have, is it a, when they're, when they're out doing the job, is it a daily job, they get as much done as they can in that day, or, or is there a scope provided? Because how would we handle that overlap we when... Have, we have an overall scope, but it's not, it, it's basically over a certain period of time that they have to do, that they have to complete. So within a year, the goal is to complete 400 miles. And Beverly Klein's here and can speak to exactly, but the, I don't think there's there's a specific daily goal per se. They don't have to do X So the fact miles. that we're going to switch... Vendors. Vendors is not going to have to be an issue with our existing one where we're like, man, you guys didn't do an extra eight miles that we needed to have you done. Now we have to have someone else do it. There's not a concern well, there. The existing contractor did fall short of our goal, and we're going to have to find a way to get back to those projects that were completed. And that's going to be with the new vendor, or we're going to hold them accountable? There's going to be a, how does that work? Well, we'll have to use the new vendor to get that completed, yes. Question. Commissioner Reed. Sure. Question. This gentleman up here, you might you hope you know the answer. Uh, uh, I knew I was going to get on Exactly. <laughs> you should have left. <laughs> it's just, just my new, but uh, uh, when you uh, have a power go out and you come and fix it and tear down a fence, is that something y'all will fix or is that the homeowner's responsibility? If, it depends. If we typically we own easements, a lot of places where our lines are, like rear lock easements, we allow homeowners to install fences on our easements as long as they we have to have access so if they don't give us access we have to gain access if we do damage typically we do go back and re and replace it or repair it and Beverly can answer to the tree contractors whenever we had an issue a few years back with one of our contractors prior to Burford doing a lot of property damage and that's why we changed um, and we didn't have that issue so much with Burford that I can recall. It was just a performance issue. Um, we actually do, are familiar with Trees, Inc. because I believe we've had them in here already supplementing mm -hmm. some of the work Burford's yeah, been good. short on. Um, but short and, or long answer to your question, yes, sir. We do repair property damage, ruts. Um, if we damage a shed or a building when we're taking down a tree or doing power line work, we'll, we'll take care of all that. The property owner just call you up and said, need some receipt relief or what how do they just do that or uh they yeah they definitely let us know if we can <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, it's ironic my, yeah, my family member had a power outage and they had some, the grandkids spent the night with me and stuff like that so uh but they got you got it all fixed up but there's some issues and stuff like that one issue with our pad mounted equipment we have signs stickers uh, placards all over them telling people not to landscape in front we have to have access to them and you know they still do and we will have when the power's out we have to pull those really nice bushes sometimes and we do not put those back because that's a violation and they know it okay other questions Okay, thank you. Um, that takes us to the audience portion on Monday, and then the mayor and members of the city commission.
the selection of interim city commissioner. Yeah, I'll, I'll address that real quickly. Um, as you all know by now, there were some technical term limit issues associated with Commissioner Walker's reappointment to the commission. He very graciously decided to just withdraw versus cause any issues. So we're back to having to appoint someone to fill that vacancy. Um, the charter just simply says that the vacancy is filled by appointment by a majority vote of the city commission. Uh, and doesn't go into the procedure. Uh, there's no requirement to inter interview anybody unless you want to uh, you know, uh, do that. So uh, that's certainly an option. Uh, really, the only procedural requirement is that you know, the appointment occur at a public meeting uh, that's publicly noticed and that the public be given the opportunity to comment before you make, make your decision. Other than that, the, the, the process is, is up to you. Um, I, I did speak to the mayor a day or two ago, and he indicated that I mean, he, he will be here on Monday, so there may, that may be a better opportunity to discuss all this. I think he's going to be missing from the first meeting in October, but we'll be back for the second meeting in October. I don't know what everybody else's schedule is like, but uh, that's all something that needs to be worked out. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do we have, by sure, do we have a required date that we have to have? Are we, uh, does it have to be a direct overlap? I mean, the, the, no, it's not. No, there's, there's not a required date. The effective date of his resignation is November 7th. So I think that the, 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 the idea would be to get someone in before that so that we can you know, work with them. They, they can meet with the department heads and, and, and you know, get up to speed on what's going on, the issues. And remember, we as a commission said we wanted to have that process of like applications and interview and paperwork going to Kelly because it never, we hadn't done that before, but we had asked, correct me if I'm wrong, we had asked as a commission to kind of put that process in place so that it, it lined up with the way you would have to run a regular election. So you would have to have a, a date to get your paperwork in by and just would help us make a better decision. I guess my question is, is if we don't, if, if we, because of because of us going backwards now and we're going to have to discuss if we want to do interviews and stuff like that, if we don't make that decision by the time Commissioner Walker is gone, that's okay? There's no heavy... Legal consequences. Okay. I mean, obviously, you want to have a full commission, but that you know, there won't be any legal consequences to that now. To not having it, okay. Right. Yes, Commissioner Madden. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just, you know, I'm seeing how this voting is going to go down in my head, and, and thinking, how do you get? Is it nine? Nine. nine can't, it's, not, I don't know if it was nine with Commissioner Walker or eight. Now. It's eight. Okay, so it's uh, and, and the court did, I believe, eight. forward those by email to the commission. I mean, how many votes would we need to have to get a majority? Like, if we all just keep picking other people, it, it yeah. requires a vote of at least four, four like, an affirmative vote of at least four members of the city commission. Right. It's gonna be super easy. No, so I mean, like, how many votes would we be up there saying, okay, like, we all put in our, our, our vote in a hat, and then it counts, and then we all pick different people? How many times would we have to, I mean, what are the chances? I'm just wondering, like, the... Yeah. We do that with some zoning cases. So it's like a lottery. Um, it's a great okay. question. So, like, do we have, like, narrow it down to finalists so that it's, you know, we could actually get to a majority vote? List or what? You can certainly do that it that take way. A lot. I mean, I'm just saying, like, I mean, if we all just start voting and then it's like I mean there are eight people we could seriously keep changing our vote and not hit it just right, right. to get four or five the majority something to consider when it's eight right yeah agreed yeah yeah Commissioner Reed um I personally stayed kind of skewed from the issue but again I don't know a lot of the candidates mm -hmm. I would like to interview some myself and to find out who you know, there's some questions I would have of them that, that I might want to ask to give me some ideas of, of what their standings are and different issues. And they're getting, I'd like to go through an uh, interview process and then my thoughts would be you'd put a name on the, all their names on the list and you'd get a button, I'd get that mark who I'd like, you'd turn it in and, and then we'll see how it goes and you go to second round and third round and hopefully you'll come up with a candidate. Right. I think that, um, to Palmer's point, that Monday's probably a better time to discuss it when the mayor's back and the majority of the commission is back as far as what the process would be. Um, what I read in the press was that the mayor said that he wanted interviews. Was I, wasn't that? That's my, that was my, my conversations with him. Okay. We, we can't have conversations right. with him, right? Right. So that's what I read in Lakeland Hour or the ledger. But um, so I think Monday would probably be the best time to discuss that when he's back and the majority of the commission's back. So is Commissioner Walker uh, absent now for, for, because of that I think reason? the only person this Monday is Commissioner McCarley. Yeah, I'll be So, so Commissioner uh, Walker will be here until we pick a new one. 
for the, the, November, November, November 7th. 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 So, so his so we hard stop is November 7th. Okay, all right, that's his last, okay. Yeah. So, so we're trying to get it done before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get somebody. And if the people who have applied are listening, you know, I would still highly encourage them to attend the Monday's meeting and to read minutes and go online and be as educated as they can be on everything that goes on at the city because it's a steep learning curve. Other questions or comments on that? Um, I have just on mayor and commission um, comments, if anybody has anything, I had two things really quick. I want to commend Patrick um, Patterson. Patterson um, in the communications department. He did a lovely memorial to Queen Elizabeth downstairs, like that will go to the history center, correct? Yeah, that was Sean's idea. Oh, good job, Sean. Sean so wanted to do a wreath. He does have Did a, you run the hobby hobby? Kinder, gentler. Everything for Patrick. He does together. have a heart. It, to Kevin, thank you for that recognition. <laughs> uh, it was my idea, but all I did was say, hey, we should do this. It was and then Patrick, Patrick I sent Patrick job. an email and actually was, said, Patrick, so I'm, nice. I'm I need to see if on the side he, he might lend his talents to decorating my home. There you he, go. He did a he great did job. A, an amazing job. I just wanted to say publicly, he did a great he job did. with that. So great idea to our city manager, but also to your your team continues yes. to do Communications did it all. I just yeah. asked for it. They they did it all. Yeah. And then we, uh, Commissioner Madden and I got to go to the Southwest Middle School groundbreaking yesterday, which is really exciting in a neighborhood that's close to us and that was had a good turnout and it was a great day. So that was fun to do in the mayor's dead. Um, I enjoyed it. Other comments? Mayor, Commissioner? Well, I'll just say that you yes. did it. Our Mayor Pro Tem made us all proud, did a great job, gave a really heartwarming speech, you know, like a mother can do who has had children in the school system. And, you know, just to think about the half cents sales tax that did not pass in 2008, you know, then passed in 2018. And so, you know, I had a child who went to Southwest Middle School, and it's long overdue, you know, 14 years later that they are able yeah. to um, do some modernization to that campus. So we were really excited for those kids and teachers and administrators to have a facility that they feel proud to, to go to and opens up their minds to learn even even better. So And local architects, yeah. which is huge yeah. for the school district. It makes my wife sad, though, because she went there. So she's oh, she she's excited. It. She's, she's going to love it. Yeah. I'm sure they'll take her for she a teach She said, I want to go America walk it one more time before they tear it down yeah. so she can remember. Well, it's the state. It'll be the same walk. Yep. No, they're just doing it on the field, while, and they're still in the old building. And then once it's built, then they'll tear down the old building, and that'll become the field. Yeah, yeah. that'll nice. be awesome. Good, good idea. Anything else from staff, anybody? Look at that. I know. You did awesome. High five to me. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's made because it's just four of us, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank y'all. Valerie, congratulations. <laughs>